Hello, I'm back. <laughs> and I'm back to talk about another feature of Pavlovian conditioning. Now, you might be getting tired of Pavlovian conditioning, but uh, uh, I'm not. <laughs> so, and uh, I'm, uh, today we're going to talk about condition inhibition. So, uh, as uh, I noted earlier, Pavlov was a physiologist. Now, physiologists uh, study excitatory processes, processes that make things happen. And there are also inhibitory processes in physiology. You inhibit neural impulses, you inhibit neural circuits, and so forth. And so inhibition is a big part of physiology. So when Pavlov transitioned to study uh, psychology and formation of associations and conditioning. Uh, he also studied condition inhibition. Now, we heard a little bit about condition inhibition when uh, we talked about uh, the long delay conditioning procedure where we saw inhibition of delay. The condition response was delayed after the onset of the CX. We're going to talk about condition inhibition in more general fashion uh, here. And uh, the basic concepts are laid out in the first slide. So the basic uh, issue in uh, condition inhibition is uh, here uh, what the subject is learning is that the conditioned stimulus indicates that the unconditioned stimulus will not happen. Okay, in a, all the other forms of, of uh, conditioning we talked about so far, uh, the CS comes to predict that the US will occur. In condition inhibition, the CS comes to predict that the unconditioned stimulus will not happen. And uh, uh, that's a special form of learning, and it involves some complications. And the reason it involves some complication is that uh, essentially to, when we're produced generating condition inhibition the, the inhibitory stimulus is followed by nothing and what we're trying to argue here is nothing can be of psychological significance and the question then is is uh, when is nothing of psychological significance or when is nothing just nothing <laughs> uh sometimes nothing is just nothing but sometimes nothing is really upsetting so imagine if i told you that i'm not going to give you a hundred dollars today how many of you are disappointed i don't imagine very many of you are because you didn't expect that i would give you a hundred dollars and so you, uh, the, you didn't expect to get a hundred bucks. You don't get a hundred dollars. Who cares? Okay. Maybe better luck next time. Tune into another episode. Maybe you'll earn a hundred dollars. But imagine a scenario where I told you that uh, I won the lottery and I, I won like a hundred million bucks and I want to share my uh, good fortune um, by giving each of you a hundred dollars. Well, you may say, "Why well, are you only going to give me a hundred dollars? Why don't you give me a thousand dollars?" Okay, I'll give you a thousand dollars, but I don't have the money with me today. I'll bring it the next time we meet, and the next time we meet, you're asking for your money. Hey, where's my thousand dollars? I said, "Oh, shoot! I changed my mind. I'm not going to give you that money after all." Under those circumstances, nothing will be pretty upsetting, <laughs> right? You expected to get a thousand dollars. And you don't get anything. So, and that's an that's an important difference. So, uh, in order to produce uh, condition inhibition, we have to create an expectation that the unconditioned stimulus will occur, and then the absence of the unconditioned stimulus is important. And then the question is, how can we create the expect expectation of the unconditioned stimulus? And uh, the answer is uh, by presenting an alternative condition stimulus. I think this is uh, illustrated in the next slide where we've got a tone as a CS and a light as a CS. When a tone is presented, a US occurs. 
when the light is uh, presented, the U.S. Is not occur, does not occur. So under these circumstances, uh, if you present the tone, it's going to create the expectation of the U.S. If the light is there and you omit the U.S., then the uh, absence of the U.S. will be psychologically significant and the light can become a conditioned inhibitor. And that is, in fact, essentially the uh, procedure for condition inhibition that Pavlov developed, which is uh, uh, diagrammed in the next slide. So in uh, a standard Pavlovian inhibition procedure, you've got two different stimuli, CSs. One is called a CS plus, and the other, other is called a CS minus. Plus indicates that the U.S. will occur with this stimulus. Minus indicates the U.S. won't. So, and you have two different types of conditioning trials. On trial type A, you present the CS plus, and shortly after the onset of CS plus, the U.S. occurs. And so, on that, uh, those kinds of trials, tri uh, trials of this, of uh, the sort type A, type A trials serve to maintain the expectation of the unconditioned stimulus when the CS plus is presented. On trial type B, we present the CS plus, so then which activates the expectation of the US, but then we don't present the US. And when we present C the CS minus at the same time, so under these circumstances, the CS minus is being paired with the, un, uh, the unpredictable or unexpected absence, the unexpected absence of the U.S. And so under these circumstances, the CS minus be, uh, becomes a condition inhibitor. So uh, this is the standard procedure for condition inhibition. You can also produce condition inhibition uh, with the use of a procedure that's called a negative CSUS contingency procedure, so which is shown in the next slide. So here the CS and the US are predicted at various points in time. But if you notice the sequence of events, uh, the conditioned stimulus is always followed by a period without the unconditioned stimulus, so that the uh, probability of the unconditioned stimulus, given that the CS has occurred, is less than the probability of the unconditioned stimulus given that the CS has not happened. And under those circumstances, the conditioned stimulus will uh, become a conditioned inhibitor. And what provides the excitatory context for this type of conditioned inhibition? It turns out the context, the uh, experimental chamber or the uh, environment in which all of these events take place uh, becomes a signal for periodic aversive stimuli. And so that provides the excitatory context for the inhibitory uh, training. Okay, uh, so these are the conditioning procedures. Uh, so they are considerably more complicated than uh, the procedures for excitatory conditioning because uh, we have to create this expectation that the U.S. will occur in order to make the absence of the U.S. psychologically meaningful. Another source of complication is how we're going to measure condition inhibition. And uh, the problem there is, uh, is that uh, if you uh, predict that the U.S. won't happen, uh, what's, how is that going to generate behavior? Uh, if you... Uh, do eye blink conditioning, for example, and I present a stimulus that tells you that there won't be an air puff. Well, you're not going to blink. Well, you also don't blink if you never learn to, to make the blink. Uh, and, and so you, it's hard to distinguish between not blinking because you're disinterested or not blinking because you're actively inhibiting your blinking. So that's a real problem. Talk about... Uh, uh, the distinction between learning and performance in conditioned inhibition, that learning performance distinction becomes hugely important in designing test procedures. And uh, the general strategy for such test procedures is uh, shown in the next slide. 
the general strategy is that you want to present an excitatory cue that will generate a, a conditioned response. Now, what you're interested in is whether a conditioned inhibitor can actually inhibit that behavior. So uh, uh, you need a, a, to compare responding to an excitatory cue to a situation in which the excitatory cue is presented together with an inhibitory stimulus, and that should produce a suppressed level of responding. But you want to make sure that you get a suppression in excitatory responding, not uh, because of inhibition and not because of distraction or some other extraneous uh, process. So you need a control test in which the excitatory cue is presented just with a neutral, uh, some other stimulus that has no particular significance. So uh, tests for condition inhibition typically includes at least three different test conditions. And uh, uh, it makes studies of uh, condition inhibition considerably more complicated. Okay, so uh, condition inhibition is more complicated than conditioning, condition excited, ex excitation. It involves more complicated test procedures. It involves more complicated conditioning procedures. And it, it's more complicated theoretically. Uh, basically, conditioned excitation and conditioned inhibition are opponent processes. And we've talked about opponent processes in several different contexts. We talked about habituation versus sensitization. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the opponent process theory of motivation. Uh, here we, we're talking about condition excitation versus inhibition. <clears throat> to produce condition excitation, you don't have to do anything ahead of time. There are no prerequisites. It makes, makes that easier. Uh, to produce condition inhibition, you first have to create the expectation that the U.S. will happen, which me means that uh, conditioned inhibition is a slave process that is tied to the in first learning excitation. And as the test procedures illustrate, uh, the actual behavioral outcome uh, uh, that you observe represents the net effect of excitation and the inhibition of that excitation in the critical test procedures. So condition inhibition is complicated. It may sound really abstract and you may wonder why in the world are we worrying about this and why is it important in my life? It turns out it is really important in your life. Conditioned inhibition is particularly important in aversive situations. Uh, uh, people uh, sometimes live in environments, unfortunately, uh, households, there, there are a lot of bad things that happen and you cannot control those bad things. And, uh, uh, and those bad things are often unpredictable. If you live in an abuse with a, parents who are uh, abusive, uh, Parents may uh, um, uh, have uh, problems with drugs or mental illness or something like that. You don't know uh, when uh, a kid says something, a parent might blow up and yell at him or even hit them or uh, scream at him and tell him to go out, you leave the house or various uh, other really uh, uh, food may be unpredictable. Lots of things can be unpredictable. It's really stressful. And it, 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 living under those kinds of stressful conditions takes a huge toll on you and your physiology. You're constantly aroused, your high blood pressure, all kinds of physiological problems associated with uh, that kind of uh, stressful environment. And that's where inhibition is really important. What's an inhibitory stimulus? <clears throat> well, the background generally uh, becomes a signal for bad things occurring. What a conditioned inhibitor does is it tell, predicts the period of safety. What are conditioned inhibitors? Well, if the dad in the household is the one who's abusive, sometimes abusive dads behave much better if mom is around. So mom becomes a conditioned inhibitor. Or an abusive dad behaves much more 
uh, 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 you know, cordially if, uh, if the pastor comes by or, or if somebody comes, a stranger visits the house, those become conditioned inhibitors. Uh, teachers are often conditioned. Teachers are safe stimuli on the whole. Ministers are on the whole are safe stimuli. And those safety cues become really important. Uh, some safety cues are having a special, uh, you know, teddy bear that uh, kids hug. Uh, another safety cue is a helmet that you wear when you're riding a bike and that uh, signals the absence of serious head in injury uh, and so on. Now, as you get older, you get more concerned about how to deal with all this stress. And if you're uh, really an enterprising about it, you might even start to read up about or look at websites and so on that talk about stress management. And what do these websites uh, talk about when they talk about stress management? Well, they talk about learning to meditate, breathing exercises, uh, and uh, prayer, and so on. What's uh, what's one of the things that I've, I've started looking at uh, meditation practices. And one of the things that struck me is meditation. There's no one meditation practice. There's so many different kinds. You know, there's Tibetan bowl meditation. Some meditation is you, you know imagine floating in a canoe in on a beautiful lake and so forth. What is common about all meditation practices? They don't talk about this. Nothing bad ever happens to people while they're meditating. <laughs> Why not? Usually the instruction for meditation is that you take a particular posture, you, you sit and so forth. They don't tell you to do that in a safe place. Don't do it if you have an unpredictable roommate who could come barging through the door at any time, blaring music or bringing 20 friends with him. <laughs> you have to find a safe, quiet place. And while, while, while you are meditating, nothing bad is going to happen to you. Generally, if you go to church, nothing bad ever happens to people who go to church. Particularly if you go to church to pray when the church is empty. I've done that a number of times. It's a wonderful experience. Nothing bad has ever happened. And if I'm really stressed out, I, I can be assured that I'm going to get peace and comfort under those circumstances. These become powerful conditioned inhibitors. And one of the... Uh, 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 values of uh, learning these meditative practices, particularly the breathing practice, is breathing breathing in a particular way as they recommended for meditation uh, can be a stimulus that you can self-administer at any time so as to experience the conditioned inhibitory safety properties of those stimuli if you happen to be in a stressful situation. So conditioned inhibitors are what's gonna allow us to successfully live through all kinds of stressful times. So even though it's complicated, it's important. And I hope I've convinced you of that. Thanks very much.